Raven from Newcastle, England was formed in 1974 with Mark Gallagher on guitar and his brother John Gallagher on bass and vocals. They'd start off with a second guitarist and go through a handful of drummers, but by 1979 they'd be down to a three-piece with Rob Wacko Hunter on drums. In 1980, this lineup would record a demo that got into the hands of Neat Records, who agreed to record two tracks for release as a single. The A-side, Don't Need Your Money, is a kick-ass track that's fast, catchy, and just packed with energy. Just listening to this track feels like a workout which is probably why their sound was described by the label as athletic rock. The single ended up getting a ton of radio airplay, where it was heard by Ozzy Osbourne. He'd immediately ask Raven to open for him, and they'd soon open for Whitesnake and Motorhead as well. With a hit single out and their popularity growing, Neat would sign Raven to record their first full-length album, Rock Until You Drop. This is an album I can't imagine ever getting tired of. Every track on here is awesome including the excellent opener, Hard Ride. We also hear the band talking before several of the tracks, adding a bit of personality to the album. Hell Patrol is one of my all-time favorite Raven tracks, with more fast, catchy riffage. Plus, we get John holding a scream for a full 11 seconds. The whole album does a fantastic job of capturing the structured chaos of Raven's live shows. There's a bit of a punk attitude, but with driving melodies, tight song structure, and unrelenting riffs. Plus, those freaking vocals. The 
album only really slows down for a nice little 50 second instrumental. In the summer of 1982, Raven would put out their second album, Wiped Out, which opens with the appropriately titled Faster Than the Speed of Light. This album expands on the sound of the first, with super fast tempos and maximum power from the guitar, bass, and drums all at once. This was a crazy album. We wanted to go harder and faster than anyone ever had, and we kind of succeeded. While Wiped Out never really goes full-on thrash metal, it's still widely considered to be a major influence on the genre, with its focus on speed and energy. Everyone in America calls us the godfathers of thrash. I think they missed the point. We were the first fast heavy metal band, I think. And a lot of people took that and distorted it. We're fast, we're heavy, but we've got melody. And, you know, we actually sing instead of shouting like an auctioneer or something, you know? <laughs> there are plenty of fast, high energy tracks on here, but there's a lot more mixed in. Like on To The Limit, To The Top, which adds some blues and prog elements too. <laughs> This is probably my favorite track on this album, and at nearly 8 minutes, it's one of Raven's longest. Tracks that didn't make it onto Wiped Out would show up on the Crash Bang Wallop EP a couple months later. But for their next full-length album, Raven wanted better production, specifically like that on Accept's 1981 album, Breaker. They'd end up getting the exact same producer, Michael Wagner, along with Accept vocalist Udo Dirkschneider to co-produce their next album. First, they'd release a three-track single, which also included a duet with Udo on a Born to be Wild cover. But the highlight to me is the third track, Inquisitor. The full album, All For One, was out soon after. The new production direction definitely shows on this album, and while there's plenty of rambunctious rave and energy, there's also a bit more variety in the tracks. Run Silent, Run Deep, for example, feels different than anything on previous albums. Run silence, run deep, 
got a really nice bridge with some great guitar work from Mark that blends in seamlessly with the faster paced stuff. This is a super classic album to me and a perfect combination of powerful riffs and catchy melodies. And again, there are some great solos throughout the album with more of a power metal twist than on Wiped Out. All For One would get picked up by Megaforce Records for release in the States. They'd also put together a US tour, and for an opening act, they'd bring along a relatively unknown band called Metallica. After touring through 1984 with bands like Anthrax, Raven would land a deal with Atlantic Records for their fourth album, Stay Hard. Stay hard, stay wet. Now this album tends to get a bad rap due to Atlantic's influence being felt a little too much in the overall presentation. And there is undeniably a more commercial sound, which alone is enough to turn some people off. But there are still some standout tracks on here for me. Wow. And I know some people find it a bit cheesy, but I love the Athletic Gear wardrobe, like Wacko's hockey helmet and shoulder pads. Well, that's basically the nature of the band. We're a very physical band. I think we're probably the most physical band. That, he wears all, you can see this rubbish on here, can't you? All the clothes, the hockey helmet and the gear. It's to protect himself from hitting cymbals and throwing drums around. The single, On and On, is also great, and it even got a music video. Completely disregarding the lyrics of the song, the video sees Raven trying to get a record deal. They visit Rusty Records, Greedy Records, and Creepy Records before eventually getting forced into their stage clothes for a concert. Overall, Stay Hard is lighter than previous albums, but I think it still has a fun energy to it. Like, even though it almost goes into a ska direction, I personally really love the instrumental closing track, The Bottom Line. Yeah, it has horns, but it's still catchy as hell. Unfortunately, Atlantic would double down on their questionable strategies for commercial success and continue giving Raven bad career advice as they started work on their fifth album. The Pack is Back is an overly commercial effort that doesn't even really capture the essence of the band like Stay Hard still did. 
Instead, it has misused horns, pretty basic riffs, and a cover of a 60s pop rock song as a single. Yeah, it's a cover of the old, old ancient song called Gimme Some Lovin'. fits our style, you know, we're sort of like a modern version of rock and roll, you know, so we thought, you know, we'd do that. we just give it a kick up the hint end, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Most tragic of all, Atlantic wouldn't even pay for a video from the album, which ended up being the last straw for the band as far as following Atlantic's creative direction. Basically, we were led up the garden path and we said, well, if you do this and if you do that, we'll be able to get you on this tour. This it was kind of a deal with the devil and it, it never worked out. The Mad EP would see Raven go back to basics with hard hitting tracks and enough aggression to justify the title. Those sweet solos are back too. They'd maintain this through their third and final record with Atlantic, Life's a Bitch. It's the most aggressive, most complete thing I think we've ever done. It's completely nuts. <laughs> Overall, Life's a Bitch delivers on the intensity you want from a Raven album, along with quality musicianship throughout. Plus, it also has my all-time favorite song about defenestration. However, there would again be no music video to support the album. There's no new videos as yet from the new record. No, it's, we're trying to screw our record company to get some good old money out of them. <laughs> we'd, we'd love to do one for something like Life's a Bitch or Pick Your Window, something pretty obnoxious off the new album. After touring with Wasp and Slayer, there'd be another shakeup when Rob would decide to leave the band. He quit in 87. He told the roadie to tell the manager to tell us. We were like, what? So we weren't happy. But, no. uh, you know, I, that, that's all water under the bridge. I understand, you know, he felt at the time he, he just had to get out of it. So uh, too much circus, there was too much drinking, and he was married with a kid on the way. So, you know, he did what he felt was right. He'd be replaced later that year by ex-Pentagram drummer Joe Hasselvander. And after breaking ties with Atlantic, Raven would get with Combat Records for their seventh album, Nothing Exceeds Like Excess. Joe seems like a good fit with the Gallagher brothers, and his tight, pummeling drums bring a heaviness to the album. John would go with a headset over the more confining floor stand microphone by this point, which was better suited for the physicality of Raven's live shows. While Nothing Exceeds Like Excess doesn't hit me quite as hard as some other Raven albums, it's still heavy and full of creative guitar work.
Architect of Fear, released in 1991 on German indie label Steam Hammer, would see Raven get even heavier. There's definitely a different feel on here than on previous Raven albums. It's thrashier and speedier and even a little darker, but Architect of Fear kicks ass. There are several great tracks on this one I could refer to, but my favorite is probably Heart Attack, which sounds like a Scorpion song on speed. I'm also a big fan of the Heads Up EP that followed, featuring four new songs recorded right after the Architect of Fear tour. There's still a bit of that early 90s thrash mixed in, but it also has World Comes Tumbling Down on it, which has a fun, upbeat, almost glammy late 80s sound. With grunge taking over the music world by this point, Raven's ninth album was released primarily in Japan and Brazil. We got a new album coming out in Japan. I hope you will pay to some very interesting people who will be interested in putting it out in the United States and Europe very soon. So you fucking people can check it out, right? Actually, Glow still hasn't been officially released in the States. And while it feels a bit dated today with its sort of alt-rock sound, it might have done well in 1994. The overall tone of Glow isn't quite my thing, but there are still some heavy hidden gems on here, like Turn On You and Victim. Raven would finish up the 90s with two solid albums that go back to a more straightforward rock your face off sound, starting with 1997's Everything Louder. Everything Louder was recorded after a re-energizing tour of Japan with little rehearsal for a frantic live feel. Uh, and a lot of this was done on the fly, but that, would, that captures the energy too. So certain songs were like, you know, half written, all right, how are we going to finish this off? And we jam it out, record it right there and then. This was followed in 1999 by One For All, which reunited Raven with producer Michael Wagner. This would also be the first Raven album released in America in over 10 years, getting picked up by Metal Blade Records. When you
With momentum picking back up, things seemed to be going well for Raven through the end of the 90s. But in 2001, while Mark was visiting a construction site, a wall would collapse on his legs. Doctors were afraid that Mark would never walk again, or worse, that they'd have to amputate. But by 2005, he was out of his wheelchair and playing shows again in a leg brace. In 2009, 10 years after their previous album, Raven released Walk Through Fire. We've got the new record came out uh, just back in March there, Walk Through Fire, finally, which has uh, you know, got a great reaction from the fans and you know, we're happy it's getting a great critical reaction as well. Fast, catchy and heavy, Walk Through Fire is pretty much exactly what you'd want from a Raven album, especially after such a long hiatus. We spent a, you know, a long time not doing stuff because I was injured and stuff. And I got, we got back to him and we really wanted to make sure we had the record out and we could then go out. So that's what we're doing now. We have been all year. So it's, it's been great. You know, we played with more people this year than I think we've played in the last 10 years, easily. There's a nice range of hard rock styles on here, with songwriting that constantly tosses in interesting ideas. For example, my favorite track has to be Trainwreck, which starts off with an upbeat old school vibe. You think you got it down, all over town. One step forward, two steps back. then works in a more subdued bridge that builds to an awesome John Gallagher scream. They turn their back on you. Now what you gonna do? The only sound you hear While touring South America in 2014, Raven would be invited by their old friends Metallica to open for them in Sao Paulo, Brazil, in front of nearly 70,000 fans, 30 years after the Kill 'Em All for One tour. We got there and it really sunk in how big the show was. It's like, oh my God. So we started doing Break the Chain, all 12 minutes with all the improv and anything. <laughs> James comes out on stage, thumbs up, starts video. The next year, Raven would release their 13th album, Extermination. <laughs> Funded partially by a Kickstarter campaign, Extermination is another overall solid entry with meaty riffs and infectious Raven energy, as heard on the album opener, Destroy All Monsters. I think it's our heaviest record and it's just there's not one song that's not s super happening. We were kind of sick and tired of people saying oh, all for one is the oh that's your best record and we're like enough like screw that record. We want to make a better record than that. Definitely up our game on this one. It's just a lot more direct. Uh, it's a combination of really heavy riffs and strong melodies.
This would unfortunately be the last album with Joe on drums, after he suffered a heart attack in 2017. Joe had a heart attack in May of last year, and basically he didn't want to be on the road anymore anyway, so it kind of, I guess, worked out for him, because now he can't. He'd eventually be replaced by Mike Heller, previously of Fear Factory, this new lineup of Raven would record their most recent album, 2020's Metal City. Having Mike on board just gives it a, sort of a different dynamic, of course, and a new player, different style, but uh, it also gives us a lot of fire that we needed. And, uh, and I think it's like a good, it's a kind of a cross between what we were doing in the early days and, and kind of what we were doing with Joe, but it's just on a diff different level, I guess. This is another fun, supercharged album with a blend of speed and melody, and Mike definitely adds another layer to Raven's sound. And again, it's all mixed together in a really interesting way, with solos often going into a completely different style than the main song. In fact, I feel like Mark Gallagher is a bit of an underrated guitarist. He's got a uniquely creative and unconventional sound that's hard to mistake for anyone else. And I can personally confirm that Raven has not lost a bit of energy, and both John and Mark are still going strong, along with Mike behind the kit. They've got quite the catalog too, so there's plenty to tackle for homework. First and foremost, Rock Until You Drop, Wiped Out, and All For One are must-listen albums for any fan of fast, melodic metal. Life's a Bitch and Nothing Exceeds Like Excess are definitely worth checking out, and Architect of Fear is excellent. Everything Louder and One For All, I think, are where Raven really nailed down their current sound and follow it up nicely with Walk Through Fire, Extermination, and Metal City. For extra credit, I would give Stay Hard a chance, and again, the Heads Up EP is a lot of fun too. I hope you dug this look back at the Mighty Raven, new wave of British heavy metal legends who developed their own sound and have stayed one of the wildest, most energetic bands out there. Let me know what your favorite Raven tracks are in the comments, and thanks for watching.